but it's after midnight now and Lupino Lane's just dropped in. Nipper Lane and his Me and My Girl company show us the Lambeth Walk as it's done at the Victoria Palace. Lupino Lane at the Locarno Streatham in 1938, singing the song for which he's best remembered, The Lambeth Walk, with the cast of Me and My Gal. In the same year, the song gave its name to a film. And once you know that much about the comedian, you know almost as much as anybody, except, that is, Phil Jenkinson, the film historian. He spent the last 20 years, or a good part of them, searching for the films that Lupino Lane made in Hollywood. Phil, what set you off on the great Lupino Lane trail? Well, really, Chris, it was an accident. Uh, a chap wrote to me and offered me some old newsreels that he had in his potting shed in Ipswich. So down I went in my car, collected these old newsreels, and among them I found a can that didn't look quite like the others. So I immediately put this film on my projector, and it turned out to be a comedian who I'd never heard of called Lupino Lane in a film that I also had never heard of called Goodnight Nurse. And, well, I sat there and I literally fell out of my chair laughing. I was absolutely in intrigued by this because never having heard of the man, never having heard of the film, I thought there must be a story behind this. So that actually set me on the trail and I started to go back through all the old movie reference books and eventually of course I then got hot on the trail and found out more about him. But Goodnight Nurse in which he plays the part of a timorous patient going to see a doctor and um, by the way the, the part of the doctor is played by his brother Wallace Lupino. Uh, he, that was the first film of his that I ever saw and that was 20 years ago. Later on, Brother Wallace uh, persuades Lupino Lane that he can't treat him in the surgery, he must go to hospital. And there then follows some marvellous business with a whole heap of bandages, a top hat, the fob watch, stethoscopes, everything. They all come out again in a really marvellously chaotic but very funny sequence. Pino's background. They were a great theatrical family, weren't they? 
Oh, indeed they were, yes. They, they go right back to the 15th century. And in fact, Lupino Lane traced his ancestry right back to Grimaldi, one of the original, and many say, the greatest of clowns. Uh, they came over to this country as mummers. They were called mummers. And they did mime shows. And eventually that evolved into vaudeville and music hall. And of course, Lupino Lane got his beginnings on the music hall stage. When would that be, roughly? That was um, around 19, uh, 1905, 1910, and then by 1914, Lupino Lane had discovered that movies had happened, and straight away he went into movies in this country, making little tiny one-reelers. How did he get his start in Hollywood? Ah, well, what he did, in fact, was to take the same course that Chaplin and Stan Laurel had done. He literally went over there, um, announced that he was an English comedian, uh, was highly talented, which indeed he was by that time, because this was now 1920, and he had a lot of experience behind him, both in front of the camera and, of course, on the vaudeville halls. And he got a job with a small uh, studio called the Educational Film Studios. In fact, they were ever anything but educational, because all they did were turn out two reelers, not by the dozen, but literally by the hundred. And between 1920 and 1929, Lupino Lane made over 42 reel films. How many of those have you managed to trace? 14 so far. Um, it's sad, actually, because there are so many more that I'd love to lay my hands on. Uh, but even finding these 14 has, has taken me 20 years, and I've found them in such strange places as a cinema cellar in Madrid, in a projection room in Sydney, Australia. Uh, the one in Madrid, incidentally, was subtitled in Spanish, just to make it even more difficult. <laughs> Why are they so elusive? What's happened to them all? Well, what happened was, you see, the little studio that he worked for, when talkies came in, they didn't, like most of the big studios, wire for sound. They decided to call it uh, a day. Uh, they sold the studio off. And then, of course, in those days, uh, there was silver nitrate in the film, which was a very, very expensive and costly ingredient. And so they sold the negatives off for the silver nitrate in them. And so the films literally became unavailable for something like half a century. Now, from the little I've seen of the footage you've brought, it seems that <clears throat> most of his film gags rely heavily on music hall jokes. Was he as inventive on film as the greats, as Keaton and Chaplin, for instance? Well, many think so. I do, certainly, because um, I think the interesting thing about Lupin Lane was the way he progressed. Um, by that, I mean he wasn't simply content to carry on doing the same old routines, the same old gags over and over again, which many, many silent comedians did. Lupino Lane was always trying to refine, always trying to improve, always trying to uh, make his gags, make his, the, the situations a little bit more tricky each time. Uh, and he developed along with the studio, uh, and it's very, very interesting to see how the first films he made were very knockabout in the sort of traditional slapstick, and how eventually he, he, he almost became, he almost got into fantasy, you know, it was quite extraordinary. He, he, the comedy almost passed to something almost like resembling The Wizard of Oz, you know. Let's have a look at him now in, in Bending Her, which was a parody of Ben Her, wasn't it? Yes, it's not so much action as inaction, because he's what you might call statuesque. <laughs> That's right, yes, he's, uh, he's been a galley slave, and he's on the run from the wicked Romans, and they've, uh, he and his brother, again, Wallace Lupino, uh, they've disguised themselves as Roman soldiers, and for reasons which are too complicated to explain, they're covered in white, and they pretend that they're statues. Now, just watch this for a marvellous piece of split-second timing. Lupino Lane with cinema audiences of the time? 
Oh, very popular indeed. In fact, if you look at old movie annuals like Picture Show and even Picture Goer of the day, you'll find many articles written by him on the art of comedy, uh, the art of clowning, the art of, the, of doing what they call Pratt Falls. That's falling flat on your back without breaking every bone in your body. And no, he was very popular indeed, and his films were popular too. Was he entirely satisfied with being a performer, or did he ever try and direct? No, he never, he never actually directed in the States. He did when he came back to England, but uh, without much success. But in the States, uh, although he had other directors directing him, people like Mark Sandrich, who later on went on to direct a lot of the Fred and Ginger Rogers films uh, at RKO, uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers films, he basically, although he had other directors, he was the real inventive mind behind the films. It was he who introduced most of the business and it was he, uh, invariably, who wrote the scripts. So the director was much more a nominal sort of figure. How fully did he script? Did he allow himself any room for improvisation? Oh, indeed, yes. Um, uh, in fact, I was talking to um, Laurie Lupino Lane, his son, who was saying that he would sometimes uh, go over and over and over a gag, a, a, a certain bit of business, and he would keep on thinking of ways in which he could extend it and make it funnier by introducing little sidelines, other little bits of business. And sometimes a lot of his two reelers would finish up running an hour and then it would be up to the poor old editor to cut all the uh, waste bits out. Well, now this next scene we're going to look at is a masterpiece of, of business, really. In contrast to the last, it's full of props. A very, a very complex little sequence, really. Sword points. Yes, I think this indicates his desire to get away from the uh, vaudeville music hall and fall about knockabout uh, genre in which he found himself. Uh, he really did want to uh, progress, and he really did uh, genuinely, I think, want to push himself and his, uh, his ability as a comedian as far as possible. And so he hit upon the idea of ingenious props as a way of giving him more opportunities for even more inventive comedy. Just watch him, for instance, with these uh, six mugs of ale and about ten large beer barrels. Sword Points, of course, was inspired by the Three Musketeers. How, how do you think that sequence was done? How were the corks made to pop at the right time? Well, my guess is, of course, there's no, there's no writing about it of the period, but my guess is that they must have had men, of course, standing behind each barrel. 
and the barrels, of course, must have had hoses in them. And either the director or somebody who knew the gag, the routine, very well indeed and had watched it several times must have called out to the men standing behind the barrels exactly when to let fire with the hoses because, as you could see, the timing was so split-second. I mean, it only had to be half a second late and the gag would have been ruined. Well, now, in Sword Points, as you say, Lupino Lane demonstrates that he can juggle with no end of props. In the next film we're going to have a look at, Movie Land, he shows that he can be funny simply in the clothes he stands up in, or falls down in. Absolutely, yes. It's amazing to see the variations he manages to wring out of a simple jacket, trousers, braces and a, and a waistcoat. Quite extraordinary. <laughs> Where did he learn to be such a supple acrobat? Oh, I think this went way back to his childhood because like, as I was saying earlier, uh, like people like Chaplin and uh, Stan Laurel, he started very early on the boards and of course uh, musical comedy in those days, we're talking now about 1910, 1915, was very, very slapstick uh, and of course it was all knockabout comedy and he, he was also very fortunate in that uh, in many joints, he was, many joints in his body, he was double jointed so when he did do what they called those Pratt falls, those what looked like really heavy falls, he didn't come to too much grief. Uh, but of course um, his acrobat acrobatic skill. He used in various ways. Um, more, more often than not, of course, he used it to absolute perfection. But there is one lovely example where he used uh, his acrobatic skills, uh, as it were, against themselves. Uh, it's in a lovely film called Drama Deluxe, and um, he's at the last minute uh, been asked to go on uh, in a troupe of tumblers and be the uh, main tumbler. And of course, he's supposed in his life never to have done this before. Uh, and you can imagine the chaos that then ensues. The point that I'm making, though, is that although this appears to be very clumsy and silly, and of course, every gag goes wrong, in actual fact, it's much harder to make gags like this that go wrong than to often to do the stuff that goes right. I mean, just see how complicated some of these gags that don't work out get. Thank you. 
that's a marvellous sequence. He's much admired, isn't he, by, by some contemporary directors? Oh, indeed, yes. Um, uh, Ken Russell has uh, his own print uh, of Goodnight Nurse, which uh, I remember the first time I showed it to him, he, I, I thought he was going to have an asthma attack because he laughs so much. Um, Stanley Kubrick has a couple of prints of his. Um, he is a great favourite with a lot of movie people, I think because, again, he had, he had this... Apart from anything else, he obviously had a great joy of filmmaking. There was a tremendous sense of fun, a tremendous sense of joy in him. Did he return to Britain after the Hollywood years? Yes, he did. When sound came in, his voice, to be quite honest, wasn't really suitable for sound. He made a couple uh, of talkies in Hollywood, but then packed it in, came back to England, uh, directed a couple of films over here that were quite successful, but his major success was uh, with The Lambeth Walk, which was going back to, right back to first base, back to his origins, back on the stage. Let's uh, finish the programme with him in Joyland, where he's taking a nap as an assistant in a toy shop, and the toys and animals come to life, don't they? That's right, yes, with uh, amazing results, because he uses, in this sequence, uh, an almost infinite number of trapdoors, which goes right back to Grimaldi, who uh, they say was one of the first clowns ever to use the trapdoor. Well, in this sequence, you'll see not one, but about 30 different, very cleverly disguised trapdoors. Incidentally, the sequence we're about to have a look at was lovingly recreated in Ron Moody's musical about Lupina Lane's great ancestor, Grimaldi. Phil, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Well, we say goodbye to Chris Kelly and Clapperboard for a while as that was the last edition in the present series.